Hello. Good evening.
So good evening and uh, welcome to SLU. My name is Helen Avery. I'm the Human Spirit Correspondent. I'm going to be here with you the next half an hour or so and we're going to be talking about the Pleiades. So um, as you're probably seeing, we've got um, a, uh, we were a bit clouded out earlier and the telescope. So we've, um, uh, we're uh, we're trying to get that sorted so we can have a visual, but you should be able to see the all sky cam on the live cast. Um, I'm just having a look now to see if it's showing. I'm not seeing that it's showing. In which case, you might want to just flip over to the telescopes page and click on Canary Three, which is hopefully which will come online later, and click the all sky camera. Uh, so if you are uh, listening on Facebook or on Twitter, then uh, if you wanted a visual, you, you might want to just hop over to slew.com, click on the telescopes, pick Canary 3, and there's a tab underneath it, which is the All Sky Cam, and uh, you'll get a look there. And you will see the Pleiades. It will look pretty small until our other sort of main cameras come online, uh, but uh, at least you'll be able to see something. Okay, so um, just checking in with the uh, all sky cam. Great. So the Pla the Pleiades, um, uh, so you know the world's most loved open star cluster is just full of myth. <laughs> uh, they were formed in about the last one hundred million years, so they're pretty young uh, as uh, stars go, um, and they're about four hundred and forty light years away. So um, so fairly, you know, sort of mid-range in terms of distance. Um, and we typically know them as the seven sisters. Uh, and they were, of course, the seven seeds and the seven brothers and the seven wives. They're known around the world typically as the seven, uh, sometimes the six. Uh, we'll talk a bit about why later. Um, but they're actually something like a thousand or more than a thousand um, members of this particular star cluster. It just so happens that the ones that we notice with our eyes here uh, when we're looking up seem to be about seven. Um, you, you can see about 14 um, with just using your eyes, um, I'm told. But mainly it's sort of seven, six and seven that are the brightest. So they're really um, it's like young hot blue stars are the ones that we can see. So they have this really lovely bluish tinge to them. And they appear to be kind of in a similar pattern to Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. So a lot of people mistake them for their little bear or Ursa Minor because they're sort of tiny and clustered together. Um, but it's not. It's actually the Pleiades. Um, and... Uh, so the, the, the main ones that we can see, those, those seven, in fact, the, the nine that are most prominent, are actually seven light years apart. Um, so there's a huge distance between them, even though they seem really, really tight together. But tonight we are celebrating them not just because, you know, they're amazing to look at, which they are, but because there's something called the midnight culmination happening at 7.52 p.m. Eastern. Uh, which you might think, well, that's a bit odd. It's not midnight. <laughs> but the midnight in this instance means really sort of the highest point um, that the Pleiades is going to reach in the sky. And tonight is the night where the Pleiades this year will reach its highest point. Um, so if you imagine sort of the hands of a clock for midnight um, pointing, uh, both pointing upwards, that sort of it's more that kind of midnight, this sort of the height. So in between sunrise and sunset, um, uh, 7.52 will be the highest point of the year that the Pleiades is, is going to appear in the sky. Um, this is in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and it was a very important time for ancient peoples across the world, actually, um, uh, although obviously chiefly in the Northern Hemisphere, um, but we'll talk about why it was important in the some Southern Hemisphere as well. Um, and we'll... Um, for, for various reasons, and it wasn't necessarily uh, a positive <laughs> reason. Uh, it was kind of ominous, and we're going to be, as I say, talking a little bit about what the ancient peoples believed would happen um, on this particular night. Uh, but first, I kind of wanted to orient ourselves 
as to where we can find the Pleiades. Um, because, you know, that one of the reasons they are um, so beloved by humanity throughout the ages is because it's so easy to see and very easy to find. Um, so if you are able to come over to slew.com and hop on the All Sky Cam, um, or if you've got clear skies where you are, and you're on Facebook and Twitter, maybe just take us outside and take a look up. And we're going to talk about how to find uh, the Pleiades. So typically the way we start is by finding Orion's belt. Now I put out a poll this week to um, on Twitter uh, to see uh, you know, what constellations people are most familiar with. And it seems to be Ursa Major and Orion, and particularly the Asterism Orion's belt. So hopefully... Most of you will know if you don't. Um, most of you will know how to locate Orion's Belt, or you'll certainly recognise it when you look up. So on the All Sky Cam, where we're going to find that is if you sort of look, think of it as a clock face. Um, about eight pm, uh, you'll see a really bright star. And that's Sirius, bright white star. And if you follow that in inwards, sort of heading towards like a two o'clock direction, you'll see three blue stars, and that is Orion's Belt. And they look pretty tight together on this all-sky cam, uh, just because of the nature of, of the, the telescope. Um, but up in the sky, they're much further apart. Uh, and you'll be able to see Betelgeuse, that's just sort of upwards of Orion's belt, is the orange star. And um, downwards, that bright white star, is Rigel. So that's the whole constellation of Orion. So that's kind of how you start to find the Pleiades, with these three stars. And if you sort of follow that line from Sirius to Orion's Belt and keep going sort of, you know, towards one or two o'clock if it's a clock face and don't use that when you're outside because obviously that the skies will be different for where you are. But if you imagine this sort of line drawn from the top right-hand star um, of Orion's Belt and keep that going, you'll hit what is like an orangey star. And that is Aldebaran. Um, which is a star in the constellation Taurus. So the Pleiades is in the constellation Taurus. So now we've sort of moved up from Orion's belt. We're now in the constellation Taurus. And this is Aldebaran. It's a red giant. And uh, it's about 65 light years away. So it's pretty close, really. Um, and um, it's about 44 sort of times the diameter of the sun. So it's it's pretty it's pretty big. Um, so you'll notice, hopefully, that Aldebaran seems to be part of a V, uh, the top left point of this V shape of stars here. This is the Hyades. Now Aldebaran is not part of the star cluster, the Hyades. It just looks like like it is. But this V is the Hyades. That's another open cluster, and it's said to be the half sisters of the Pleiades. So we're gradually working our way up to the Pleiades. Um, and uh, that, they're about 625 million years old, uh, and that, they're about 150 light years away. So nearer than the Pleiades, but still pretty impressive. So that's kind of like the, the head of the ball. In some depictions of the ball, the V sort of comes back into, into the body a little bit and, and isn't the head. But it's sort of um, a great way of locating Taurus is this little V. And then we head up just following that line that Orion's belt gave us from Aldebaran that, for that same line. And you'll come to this blue blob on the all-sky cam. Um, or if you're up in the sky, you'll have found the Pleiades, if you're, if you're looking up in the sky. That is the Pleiades. So it looks like a blue blob here on the All Sky Cam, but if you were to just use your eyes and look up at the sky, you would see very clearly at least six stars um, that you may recognize, as I mentioned, of looking similar to the shape of the Great Bear or even the, the Little Bear or Little Dipper as it's more commonly called, and those are the Pleiades. So I just wanted to let you know where they are. November is such a good month to go and see the, just step outside and see the Pleiades. So hopefully this will give you some sort of guidance as to how and where, you know, where to find them. They're, they're pretty, once you've locked them, they'll be with you forever. And so it's definitely worth going up and seeing them. Um, and then I have booked, if the clouds uh, clear up and we can get the telescope open. I 
Oh, great. I've just been told um, by the studio that, that they're opening. Fantastic. So, um, <laughs> so hopefully, Canary 3 that's going to be opening. Now, here's, here's the rub. We can't see the Pleiades in Canary 3 right now <laughs> because, because of the way the telescope is. But you will see it's 8.30 p.m., 8.45 and 9. And I reserved the telescope so you, you will be able to come back and look on Canary 3 at 8.30, 8.45 and 9 and see the Pleiades close up. You'll see, all the, well, all seven of the stars, more than the seven you'll see like nine clearly 14 probably clearly and a whole bunch of other stars and it's really really worth doing because another thing about the Pleiades is they're moving through a dust cloud which makes them kind of um uh well they're sort of nebulous so they have this really sort of dreamy feel to them when you see them up close and even if you see them with your eyes in the sky you kind of get a sense that they're sort of you know sort of I don't know sort of mystical and misty um and one of the most famous things ever written about them was by Tennyson. Uh, and I'll just read you a couple of lines, what he said about the Pleiades. He says, many a night I saw the Pleiades rising through the mellow shade, glitter like a swarm of fireflies tangled in a silver braid. And when you get a, a good look at this sort of nebulosity of the Pleiades, if you see it in the um, in, uh, in Canary 3 later this evening, you really sort of can understand what Tennyson was talking about, this sort of swarm of fireflies tangled in a silver braid, like you can sort of, you know, feel the sort of braids and wisps coming off of them. So definitely, if, um, I'm excited that we're going to get to see them later. Um, so definitely make sure you, you pop back and see them then. But otherwise, I say, hopefully you can see them in the all-sky cam, really at a distance. Uh, and or you can pop out if you've got clear skies and have a look. We don't have clear skies here in New York, not particularly, although the moon is looking cracking tonight, so we have that at least. Okay, so let's talk about some of the beautiful myths about the Pleiades and then get into why tonight in particular uh, is um, they're so important. So, okay, dokie. So one of the reasons that we have these myths of the Pleiades um, is because, and they're so varied and you can find them across the globe and across cultures, is because, as I mentioned, it's very, very visible. Um, it's very sort of noticeable. All the other constellations are very spaced out. And then there's this sort of group of stars that's really squished together. So they really sort of catch your eye. And also they're near these other constellations, uh, Orion, that. Um, and within Taurus that, that have, you know, very um, sort of easy to find and have been a sort of a pattern that's really called to humanity as they've looked up over the years. Um, so uh, also you see that in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, right down to the Mid-Southern Hemisphere. So, I mean, and that's sort of unusual that um, a constellation has such meaning in both hemispheres and it really does. So we're going to just sort of talk a little bit about uh, what they were seen as among the different cultures. And I've just got a list here of um, some of the things they were regarded as. So we know them as the Seven Sisters, typically, and that comes from Greek myth. Uh, and it's this myth that um, Zeus um, was sort of chasing these seven daughters of Atlas. Atlas and Pleione had these seven daughters, uh, beautiful daughters, the seven sisters. And, you know, and if you've listened to me talk on Sue before, you'll know that, you know, Zeus is a, is a, is a bit of a dog. <laughs> He's always chasing women. And Atlas was absolutely not having it um, with his daughters. So he turned, the, the legend goes that he turned his daughters into celestial doves and put them in the sky to be protected. And then another legend goes that he went one step further and put Taurus the bull in front of Orion, uh, who represents Zeus, um, so as to separate them and, and forever guard them so Zeus never gets his wicked way with any of Atlas's daughters. So we know them typically in the West um, because of the Greek myth as the Seven Sisters. Um, but they are known as something different around the world. 
so we have, um, let's see, there are just so many here. So we have the, um, the close pack, that was Welsh, um, a herd of camels or the little ones that was uh, um, from the Arabians, ancient Arabians. Uh, the Hindus are slightly different, actually. In India, they were known as a flame. Um, in China, they were the seven sisters of industry. And they're mentioned in the Bible, actually, in well, both the Old and New Testament. Um, and in the New Testament, in Revelations, they're, they're mentioned just as the seven stars. Um, let's have a look. at Seven little nanny goats. Uh, when it comes to sort of the Scandinavian myths, they were known as um, a hen with her chickens. There were these seven little sort of chicks. Uh, seven seeds was another one. Uh, so this and um, so they're sort of known uh, all over the world. There, just some other ones here. So New Zealand, they're huge in New Zealand, and I know that they've been trying to get a national holiday going to celebrate the Pleiades, just because of how much it means to the Maori. And there, they're known as the Matariki, which means the little eyes. Um, uh, to the Aboriginals, it's such a the Seven Sisters is such a huge part of their culture of the dream time, and there they are known as the Seven Sisters as well. But they're also elsewhere called the Seven Wives, um, the Seven Orphans, because on and on and on. In some, some cases, they're called the Six, uh, where um, they haven't been able to see Seven. To the Egyptians, they were called the Atari or the Atoria, or um, uh, and it's sort of like Hathor. It's sort of the derivative is, sort of comes from Hathor and can be pronounced Arthur, which I think is really, really interesting, as we'll talk about later a little bit about King Arthur and how the Pleiades ties into all that. So um, why were they so important? Why did all these cultures give them, give them names um, and write you know, stories about them? Uh, and it's... Uh, because they coincided with spring and fall. So in the Northern Hemisphere, you could see the Pleiades uh, just before dawn around the time of March, April. Um, so it signaled the coming of spring and a time to plant. And then the Pleiades could be seen uh, again in uh, October, November time. They were here on the horizon after the sunset, and that meant that it was time to um, harvest. Uh, and because of precession, was slightly that's slightly changed now. It's sort of more like April, and then sort of later November. So it's a bit different. Um, and then this sort of became to signal spring and the coming of winter. So you can imagine that ancient peoples; they're incredibly important because um, they sort of dictated the calendar for agriculture. And so there are lots of celebrations when the Pleiades were seen because, you know, they were bringing spring and new life, but also they were sort of um, celebrating the end of, of the harvest, but also the coming of winter and like a, a dying out. Um, and that was, you know, just reversed in the Southern Hemisphere. It was exactly the same. So that's why it's actually very important for the Maori um, of New Zealand. Because, okay, because, um, because they could be seen. Um, and we'll come back to this in a bit because we're getting close to midnight culmination. So I want to talk a little bit about what, why this was seen as a particularly like, prominent night. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, where do we begin? So the um, there are a lot of uh, uh, how do we call it sort of structures that have been built uh, that line up with the Pleiades. Um, there are Greek temples. There's uh, uh, the um, uh, Native American Devil's Tower that's in Northeast Wyoming. There's um, the Upton Stones that are in Massachusetts. You know, the, the Parthenon and the Greek temples. The pyramids are claimed to line up with uh, the Pleiades, um, many of the sort of uh, temples in South America and Central America is said to line up with them. And one reason, one sort of theory put out is that they line up with this midnight culmination and that ancient peoples would celebrate this particular day as a commemoration 
for something that had happened in the past. And that was the destruction of a civilization. Now, it's really, there seems to be sort of no concrete evidence of this. And I've looked back, but when you start to get into astronomy books that are, say, like 100 years old or so, like um, William Tyler Olcott's book, Star Law, um, and actually, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Burnham's books, um, but he references a lot of ancient books. And they sort of just sort of talk about, you know, people who are out exploring, meeting people, um, sort of native indigenous people in, in, in their travels in like Papua New Guinea um, and uh, in, in Mexico um, that were telling them of this, um, this sort of connection between this culmination of the Pleiades and a civilization that had been lost. So I just want to read you, I've got a couple of minutes, so I want to read you something that Burnham wrote about the, um, about the culmination. Okay. So he says that, um, that this particular night, this we're hitting in one minute, uh, was observed with solemn ceremony in countries as widely separated in space and time as pre-Columbian Mexico and ancient Persia. Uh, and William Tyler Alcott, I mentioned earlier, suggested that these commemorate this great cataclysm that occurred in ancient times, causing a loss of life. And it seems to be associated with the destruction of a civilization due to a flood. We don't know whether the Pleiades were in midnight culmination when this flood happened, whether the Pleiades were in the sky and visible when this uh, great um, flood happened or this destruction happened but we will sort of, we can sort of know that the Pleiades came in sort of March April when the rainy seasons would have started for spring and left in sort of October November when the rainy seasons um, would have occurred again before winter so it's not a leap to say that something happened when the Pleiades were in the sky that resulted in the dis the, a flood that may have destroyed an ancient civilization. And here we are right now at the midnight culmination. <laughs> so it was said that right now, whenever there was a midnight culmination, that the world could end again, that a civilization could be destroyed once again. I'm still here. Are you still here? I <laughs> you're still here. Um, so that on, these, on this particular date, at this particular time, ancient peoples would hold ritual and ceremony. And they would stand high on hilltops and on mountains um, and build structures to allow them to view the Pleiades. Um, on the Aztecs, it, said, uh, it was said, actually um, uh, offered human sacrifice once every 52 years at midnight culmination because they believed that the world had certain um, moved in in certain ages. In fact, the Aztecs had a their calendar, and and um, ancient Mexico used to have um, their calendar was part lunar and part governed around the Pleiades. And once every fifty two years, these calendars would coincide together on this one night where they believed could be the destruction of the world again. We're all still here. This is good. Okay. But what I wanted to talk about was, you know, what was this deluge that um, could have happened? What was this civilization that could have been destroyed? What is this reference um, that people could have been talking about? So Burnham talks about Atlantis. Were they possibly referring to this sort of myth that we all know today, and we just believe it's a myth, um, of Atlantis? Was there this civilization that drowned so I just want to read you some of the things he says because it's really fascinating and we'll talk about some of the some of the other um the other theories in a little bit so he says um the legendary sinking of the mythical Atlantis we might speculate is possibly this catastrophe modern students and bear in mind Burnham was written in sort of 1970s about 50 years well 40 odd years ago 40 50 years ago modern students of ancient law have placed Atlantis uh, a wide variety of sites ranging from the Azores through to Gibraltar and Patagonia no one really knows where it is but the fashionable theory is that the legend came from an eruption of a volcano near Santorini in Greece um, on the island of Thera in the Aegean Sea, actually about 70 miles north of Crete. 
And this catastrophe is dated to about 1450 BC and was evidently one of the most violent volcanic explosions ever recorded on the Earth. Um, uh, and according to some theorists, the Santorini eruption may have been one of the chief causes of the downfall of the Minoan civilization. So there is this idea that maybe uh, Atlantis is referring to the Minoans and that this culm midnight culmination of the Pleiades um, is when or is a sort of a commemoration of the loss of this civilization of the Minoans. So the Minoans um, were sort of flourished in the Middle Bronze Age in Crete from about 2000 BC until about yeah, sort of little, sort of 1400, 1500 BC. And um, they were really, really advanced. And we know this because, you know, they've uncovered many temples um, uh, and ruins. Um, uh, and we found sort of things like weapons and uh, sort of ceramics um, that sort of suggest that they had, there was a whole power structure in place that they were really advanced. And they also were really into bull worship. There's a lot of um, sort of uh, monuments that have been found or sort of statues and artwork around bulls. Uh, so one report I read sort of says that, you know, there was the worship of bulls and there was also this sport of bull leaping and also the, this, these, possibly these Minoans gave birth to the idea of the Minotaur or the sacred bull. And again, it's kind of interesting because Pleiades is within Taurus. Um, the bull itself so you know sort of the imagination starts to go wild when you think well I wonder if maybe this you know midnight culmination in Pleiades were, were all the well ancient ancestors or ancient peoples were celebrating a, a, a race that um, that worshipped the bull uh, and one way of you know and the Pleiades was obviously within within that constellation we just don't know and then Burnham goes on to say, well, you know, maybe another theory is that this lines up with the sort of biblical flood. Uh, and again, it's sort of a nice, nice sort of story to think about because the Greek myth is that, um, as we mentioned, that the seven sisters were celestial doves uh, in the sky. So, you know, the doves in the, in the biblical uh, deluge story. Um, and... Um, so uh, those are some ideas uh, of why uh, this was, you know, this particular night was seen as connecting with um, uh, with the destruction of a, of a civilization. But then you start to think about other things that are happening around this time of year. Um, I wonder if maybe uh, everyone kind of knew or had heard about this particular event um, because there are so many festivals around the world that occur between sort of the end of October and, and sort of early November. And because of precession, you know, we're now on the 21st of November, but a couple of thousand years ago would have been um, uh, sort of the end of October, beginning of November. So some of the festivals uh, you'd see, um, you know, you have Diwali in India, which is sort of light overcoming dark. Um, we have uh, probably more familiar to, to you is All Hallows' Eve um, and, uh, you know, Halloween and All Souls' Day and Day of the Dead. So there are several festivals around the world where around this time there seems to be a celebration or a commemoration of the dead, of, of those lost, like lost souls perhaps. Um, and it's, it's not a leap that, that many sort of um, – storytellers <laughs> I want to say but um, as, as astronomers and, and you know those interested in myth have said that these all spin from this midnight culmination of the Pleiades and the midnight culmination of the Pleiades was something that was sort of memorialized you know probably about 3,000 or more years ago depending on when you think the demise of um, Atlantis uh, and the, the, the deluge the, the flood was which would have been you know, yeah, about 2,000 odd years ago, perhaps, um, particularly for the Minoan civilization, seemed to, seemed to end about then. Um, and the flood, obviously, a lot, uh, the biblical flood, obviously, a lot before that. Um, but it would have been, as I say, sort of around October, November. So 
um, there have, as I mentioned, sort of been these connections made that maybe Halloween, although it sort of marks this period between the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice, maybe would have occurred at the same time as this midnight culmination of the Pleiades, given it's sort of this extra power. Um, you know, Halloween is a time when we say the veil is very thin. <laughs> um, and it's sort of a, a sort of connection to the dead. Uh, so, I, you know, it sort of backs up this idea that maybe this time of year, this, this midnight culmination of the Pleiades that was occurring around the world, sort of had this connection to some sort of commemoration or connection to those who are passed on. I personally just love this, love thinking about how it's this whole civilization that has been lost um, that's been commemorated just because, you know, it's so sort of juicy in story and myth. Um, so what else have we got here? There are a couple of other things that I wanted to to talk about. Um, yeah, so uh, Burnham also goes on here to talk about how how this, you know, might have been the, the witch's Sabbath or the Black Sabbath where there was sort of unholy revelry high in the crags and up on these hills. And you can sort of imagine that maybe people were building tall structures to celebrate this midnight culmination by being up up high. And this comes back to what I was mentioning earlier about the, the sort of link between the Egyptians um, and King Arthur. So as I mentioned, the Egyptians called the Pleiades, um, the, called them Ather, Ather. Um, and it's thought that that sort of led to the word tall, which in Brit British means like a hilltop or a high place. Um, and may have even led to the word Arthur. So if you've ever been to Edinburgh, there in the middle of the gorgeous city of Edinburgh, it's a huge, huge park. Um, and Arthur's seat is an enormous hill uh, within that. And it's, let's say it's called Arthur's seat. And so some, some people have said that it's actually um, in honour of, uh, it's seen as sort of a link to the Pleiades that you could... Um, climb up it and have rituals for the particular particularly this midnight culmination of the Pleiades every year um, and similarly on these some of these tours these hilltops in Britain they were used for similar um, events where people would go up every year and, and host a ritual um, and uh, the um, the Upton Chambers in Massachusetts, it has been discovered. Well, it's sort of again, it's a kind of a theory, as as with all of these, you know, what the pyramids point at, etc. But that the Upton Chambers in Massachusetts, their stone sites are in line with the Seven Sisters during the the midnight culmination of the Pleiades. So maybe next year we can we can come live from <laughs> come live from Massachusetts and check it out. Um, and uh, so I think that's kind of, um, what are we looking at, eight? So there's so much we could talk about in the Pleiades. I mean, it just goes on and on, and there's so much rich story. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll talk more about it. And next Sunday, we're actually going to be taking uh, an hour to look at Taurus and talk about myth of the sacred bull. And we'll be revisiting a bit of the Pleiades then and sharing a couple of the Native American stories about the Pleiades, because those are really, really beautiful, and um, the Aboriginal stories about the Pleiades. But, um, so I'm just checking in on the telescopes. Just bear with me a second to see what we've got. Mm -hmm. Okay, so great. So Canary 3 is open. Right, now uh, it's on a mission. <laughs> Great, intergalactic wanderer, fantastic. But in uh, in half an hour, eight thirty, so sort of twenty five minutes, the uh, Canary Three is going to be pointed at the Pleiades, and it is a really, really clear sky. So we're all still here to see the Pleiades, the sort of doom and gloom um, that could have happened tonight. The sort of ending of the world it didn't happen. So. Uh, Make sure you come back about eight, so eight thirty or eight forty-five and nine are the other reservations that I made on this particular cam, so you can see the Pleiades. There's some great things nearby as well, the Hyades 
uh, and um, the Crab Nebula is in Taurus, and then obviously the beautiful Aldebaran, that star we talked about earlier. So there's a lot to see, especially all week. You know, if you're if you're interested, then certainly come back, reserve a telescope for any of those, um, and you'll get some really good views. Uh, especially if you're looking at stars, maybe pop to Canary Two, but for the Pleiades, Canary Three is awesome. And of course, get out. That's what we always advise you to do, to go out under the stars and look up instead. And and maybe just sort of, you know, have a think about, is it, could it possibly be true? Was, was, did Atlantis exist? Uh, was there this catastrophic event that happened when the Pleiades were high in the sky in, in November um, uh, that caused some sort of catastrophe that took out an entire civilization that people around the world knew about and celebrated um, or commemorated rather every November by honoring the dead and did that in fact sort of lead into what we know as as Halloween or the day of the dead or many of these festivals that we have around the world or is it all just a big myth and really you know the celebrations are all about sort of like the death of the season and it's just a moving into winter so you decide and so um, I'm gonna head off so you've got some time to pop out uh, take a look up at the Pleiades and then come back and look at the telescope Um, as I mentioned Sunday at nine um, I'll be back talking about Taurus and that's going to be a lot of as I say story about the sacred bull and the importance, uh, including sort of Paleolithic paintings that show the Pleiades, um, as well as Taurus the bull. And I wrote a little something on the on the illuminations today, actually, if you're interested in taking a look at that. But before that, even tomorrow, there's going to be um, discussion of the super moon challenge. The super moon is December the third, and we're kicking off our challenge tomorrow. So uh, I think Paul's taking that on at 2 p.m. to explain what we're asking you to do. I'm very, very excited um, about this upcoming supermoon. As I mentioned, if you if you can get out and have a look at the crescent moon tonight, it's really worth it. It looks amazing. And you'll see it just growing fuller and fuller every night as we move towards the supermoon. But we've got so much stuff coming up at SLU in the next few weeks. Um, so keep an eye, if you can, on the sort of main page. Keep a look on um live cast and see what we're up to uh, and also sort of suggestions for the telescope dr page godfrey makes some wonderful suggestions of what you can see through our telescopes um uh, at this moment so keep an eye on those and uh yeah in the meantime i hope you enjoy the Pleiades. definitely see if you can come back at 8 30 8 45 and 9 to canary 3 and have a look and if you're listening on facebook or twitter it's really simple. Slew.com, head over, click on the telescopes. You'll find Canary 3 there. Click on Canary 3. It's all free and you'll get like a real close-up view of those beautiful seven sisters. So I wish you all a good evening. I'm glad you're all here. <laughs> but we're still going. And look forward to speaking with you soon. <laughs>